everybody uh welcome to all for a very interesting instruction course uh, uh, that is trouble shooting unhappy cataract surgery patients uh as we all know that uh, uh, cataract surgery has become more of a customized refractive surgery with high expectation from patients in this era we wish to address the problems faced by the patient in this course aim to be appropriate step by step diagnosis and management of strategy we can do the minimize the issue have a happy patient we'll be approaching this issue in a very detailed manner from anterior segment pathology problems intraoperative issue postoperative surprise and posterior segment pathology involved we have got uh, a galaxy of speaker which is headed by none other than uh, professor dr rohit shetty i call him to the dais i also invite dr vikram jain i call uh, dr shaman shetty dr sunil ganekal and dr sharath hegde to the dais so the, these are the few important talks will be talk uh, talking so to start with uh, i think as i already said uh, very important aspect in cataract surgery for unhappy patient always it is associated with the ocular surface disorder i think the best person to explain this none other than the rohit shetty he is the uh, ceo of narayan netrale and also medical director and probably the man you can really listen from him over to you dr rohit AV, AV guys just can come and help uh, Dr. Rohit. Thank you Dr. Christopher Sajkudlu and his uh, team for this uh, opportunity. My, speak, my talk today is on uh, ocular surface and cataract. To the achieve the best outcome of the surgery, one of the most important factors is uh, looking at a healthy ocular surface. We all know that uh, the incidence of uh, and severity of uh, this increases after cataract surgery and poorer outcome if battery is not working well. The poorer outcome is dependent on your refractive outcomes even uh, in a pre-surgery record. And there's always a chance of uh, more post-operative complications followed with this. So from the ocular surface point of view, we would like to approach this talk from these uh, points. The symptoms, the clinical examination, imaging, and the fear frame. Let's look at the symptoms. There are fantastic questionnaires today, like Oc Ocular Surface Disease Index, which I use, which gives you a scoring based on what the patient finds. And if the patient has moderate to severe status, then starting with your biometry, to your outcome, everything has a very suboptimal outcome. The clinical outcome examinations include your typical uh, lid margin changes, your Shermus and uh, T-butt, which is part of uh, the routine assessment, and many times they may be not be very clinically relevant or apparent which for which you need to do something more deeper. When you see more deeper, Today, mybography is part and parcel of refractive practice, and cataract is going towards refractive cataract surgery. So I think incorporating a mybography in your premium practice is not a very bad idea because a lot of these young, a lot of these elderly people do ha suffer from these kind of dropouts of those glands. And having a dropped glands and deterioration of gland morphology, ocular discomfort, which leads to suboptimal outcome is quite common today. So we did some more deeper assessment of what happens to the quality of the tear film. And one of the ways to look at the quality of tear film is look at the optics of the tear film with an OS OCAS system. And the new assessment system, which looks at the visual quality index, that means how your quality of vision is affected by your tear film. That means anything in the green band means your quality of tear film is good, so your scattering and other things are very minimal. When your tear film fluctuates from green and starts moving up and down, 
you know that your tear film has a huge impact on your quality of vision. Let's assume that this patient is your multifocal patient and is very happy with, with what he's seeing. And this patient happens to be your multifocal again and he's complaining of glare. The problem is in both this patient, it's not your uh, multifocality, it's actually the tear film which is playing the, the phantom here. And these tear film I mentioned early has an impact on your IOL calculation because if you have a scatter like this, your biometry itself would be a challenge and risk of glare and halos post-surgery after these procedures. And it also has an impact on how the epithelium heals. For example, an epithelium which is more regular is an indirect surrogate marker of a healthy ocular surface. Epithelium like this, which has got multiple changes, is a surrogate marker of hidden poor ocular surface. And what does it imply? When you proceed with any of the surgeries, poor nerve healings, poor optics, quality of vision being bad, and all these factors have a huge impact into the study. Coming a little bit into true research of looking at the ocular surface from an inflammation point of view, we started using uh, one of the world's first point of care diagnostic kit to look at multiple inflammatory molecules which cause, which create an environment of rubbing, pain, irritation, glare, and suboptimal healing. And all this we have it in your, in your, we call it the lab on chip concept. In future, these things will be readily available along with your other diagnostics, like how you do a blood test, it will tell you which one is higher or lower. Based on that, we can really pre-treat them. I use the word pre-treatment because pre-treating them is better than trying to color a tsunami after the procedure. Now, if you don't have all this, we build a small algorithm for the cataract surgeons with available measures in your clinic. Like I said, if your OSDI, ocular surface disease index is lower, and if it's mild, moderate, and severe based on the OSDI and your T-buds. And apart from that, you add a little more imaging stuff to it, like how regular or irregular is your epithelium, add the gland loss. You can actually decide how, which are the patient who require a pre-treatment, both from the topical and procedural. Procedural would include your lippy flow or I light or one of these procedures. Because what happens is when you have your patients coming for any refractive surgery, if you start looking at this, and if you start, this is something which we try to incorporate into the cataract surgeon's mind, because this is what we incorporated as refractive surgeons. As refractive surgeons, this is in, it's a part of our DNA of a workup in the mind when we see these kinds. But refractive cataract surgery many times Concern is more about your microscopes or the multifocal lenses or the premium lenses. And many times ocular surface is not given this due respect which it needs. So if you are practicing and you feel that you want to be perfect in whatever you do, it's just not the surgery, it's what happens to everything else after you do the surgery. And this again helps you to give an understanding about titrating it or treating it. In future, when you have the kits, you can actually use it. I'm not going to go deep into this. The post-op regimen is lid hygiene, preservative-free drops. Keep the dry eye measurement as one of your parameters when patients keep coming to your clinics more often. And uh, artificial tears, whatever you like. And if it's really severe, probably looking at uh, cyclosporin-based uh, therapies. And there are like highlight and other procedures which you can use after three months. Lippy flow, again, because it's, it in induces some amount of pressure, maybe a little later, but highlight or IPL or one of these procedures can be used much earlier. So the question is, I've used only lippy flow here, but it can work the same way for the highlight or IPL. What does it actually do when, you're, when a patient comes to you uh, who has these kind of challenges and which are not getting treated with uh, your uh, uh, with your conventional therapies of medications. So this was presented in part at the ASCRS meeting. Molecular and other factors, what happens when you do this? This was 
We did it for refractive surgery, but, but it's exactly the same when you do it before cataract. What we did was we did the procedure before and after and see which one is better. What's important is all those molecules which I mentioned get sudden, gets completely yeah. reduced. You can see that these molecules which actually cause the patient to come back to you, come back to you with pain. My, when I rub my eyes, my eye hurts. I put water into my eyes. There are a lot of these complaints which are extremely difficult for you to answer, especially about this eye. After one year, still it hurts and all that. After you've given them the best of vision. And many of them is driven by these factors here. And these factors actually can be reduced when you use these modern day therapies, which kind of balances the ocular surface immunology and gives you a much, much better healing and outcomes. And this is, this is a study from that. So what is the take home point? Irrespective, irrespective of how good your skill, machine, techniques, and how good the researchers have, the companies have got you the best lenses, the challenge always is how well you have taken care of ocular surface, both pre-surgery, I repeat, pre-surgery and post-surgery, which sometimes gets missed in this whole noise of uh, the techniques and technologies and skill you have done. Optimization, both pre and post, using medications. And earlier, it was only gallons and gallons of drops. Now it's not just gallons. You, you can use some procedural right therapies, which is faster because you don't want a premium surgery cataract patient coming back to you because he has a silly uh, itching. Because once he does that, he's not bothered about 20, 20, 10, 6 vision you're given. He's bothered about his quality of life is messed up because he just keeps watering. When he sees a bright light at watering, you have to sort it out if you want to go to the next level of attracting more of those kind of patients. And these patients talk to each other very well. So optimization is very important. And uh, treatment, this is a take home point from this. Treatment of post-operative dry eye has to start preoperatively. And it is not about, it's like tsunami. When it's, it's, it's not trying to, uh, trying to fit a problem, trying to treat a problem which probably could have been avoided to begin with. And I think that is the biggest take home point. I thank Dr. Kudlu, sir, and team for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. I think a couple of questions from my side. Someone starting a premier cataract surgery, of course, uh, in the previous session also, everybody addressing that uh, tackling dry eyes, ocular surface disorder. Do everybody really require a mimography in their clinic or when they're doing with autorefractometer, is it a point to really measure about the mimography? See, it's like, it's a very difficult answer. If you want to go from the finance and other things, we don't have a right answer, but it's like today, in your practice, if you are doing a premium cataract surgery, do you think that uh, you would like to avoid a uh, uh, good biometer? You would not. Because from you, that has become, 10 years back, you would say, I would do a immersion or you'll do an A scan. So world is changing. So these machines will give you back the money much faster than what you actually calculate on your balance sheet. You bought the IPL, yeah. and at by that point <coughs> of time, you said that you don't, Udupi does not have dry eye, who would probably have put. Now, don't you think that was the best decision? Happy birthday, Sunil. Sunil. <laughs> Happy birthday, I said. <laughs> so, I think that is, I think, the way you have to say it. So, if you want to create a good practice, you have to have good things which gives you a gives you the power to create a good practice. And trust me, all this pays you much faster than your FACO machines. And one more thing, see, after doing the mimography, you really grade how much is the mimovian gland dysfunction. Once the patient come to the OPD, do you have to continue with the our uh, uh, fluorescent straining and other uh, necessary? You can, you can. See, like I said, there are a lot of technology one you use and keratograph gives you non-contact measures also. Like you s keep a small space somewhere in your clinic or small space in your one of your clinical room, which does only this assessment. So that itself will create a branding and that itself will create a kind of a small powerhouse 
for an extra practice and extra income for you which is which is different from what you're doing and always pack don't package it you create a different charging for it so it can give back whatever and there's no consumables use so you're going to and the patients who have a uh, more gland loss you know you 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 can ask them for the procedural treatment like lippy flow or highlight or one of them so you know actually you're building up your practice and then the word spreads that you're doing things differently rather than just jumping and uh, shooting everybody in the dark and uh, the patient with a very severe dry eye i think you have to advise them either with the lippy flow or with the highlight treatment so how many sitting you do and after the your treatment how much gap you have to give take them for a cataract surgery when we look at these markers we studied it takes around 2 to 1 half 3 weeks for these markers to reduce so after you do the procedure any intraocular procedures if you give around 2 and 1/2 3 weeks all your markers would have reduced and you'd have dampened their inflammatory schedule a lot of people do today and next day morning tomorrow morning it doesn't go off so well so so fast so i think after the treat after the cataract surgery after the multifocal no, this is pre operative pre op see if you find a problem that's what the last take home point treat pre operatively not post operatively yeah post operatively wait for 3 months because your steroids is still acting and keep this patients on cyclosporin drops all this will change the ocular surface for better especially you have to be very careful in a person who has already had a pterygium and you're doing a premium pterygium may be very small you may say that pterygium is not its pterygium does not come to a healthy ocular surface patients so when you doing a pterygium it's not about encroaching the cornea or how the corneal curvature is changed it's about a indirect measure that this person's ocular surface is unhealthy unhealthy see for example people from the coastal lot of them have pterygium if you ignore them for a premium 50% of your patient will so but if you are aware of this pterygium is an very different level of autophagy that's the the housekeeping of the ocular surface is unhealthy so it's it's a mechanism of that and these patients when you treat them post operatively give them high the trehalose based drops because these patients do very well with the trehalose because their mechanism of autophagy on ocular surface is abnormal so remember this it's not just about the how it affecting the cornea it's about how it's impacting the ocular surface and 3 months later you can do a repeat lippy Uh, i light lippy flow you'll have to wait for 6 to 8 months in that way i light probably has a more advantage for it thank you so much rohit i think it is a pleasure to be have of our uh, instruction thank course you. hope to see you in every time in our uh, you have a question a- any questions thank you so thank you thank you so much uh, dr rohit chetty uh, next we have uh, dr krishna prasad kodlu again somebody who does not uh, need any Uh, for their introduction he is uh, the director of uh, prasad netralaya uh, the entire group and member uh, scientific committee over to you sir once again uh, just to in continuation of before they are lo- uh, loading my presentation whether you do premium cataract surgery or not the premium cataract surgery i think every cataract surgery dry eye workup is key without dry eye workup you go ahead with uh, this is what uh, even in the previous session professor kk mehta was also telling that oh moti bind a gaya pehle karenge baad mein dekhenge no first you workup thoroughly pre op then you go ahead with that that is the take home message our cataract patients so around 50% which is a good number i think uh, that should be part and parcel of every uh, post cataract surgery may some people want to avoid it in the first week because there uh, there be multiple medications they don't want the patient to skip the steroid and use the lubricant fair enough but at least after one week make sure to start your patient on lubricants it so anyway. it depends on the native uh, osd how much is there even if it is not there it will uh, give a lot of comfort if the patient didn't have any dry eye before then for the first two months definitely and then you can 
stop it. So Dr. Kudlow is having some. We'll have Dr. Sunil Ganekal with his talk. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, two important and the basic problems one tend to face uh, with the phaco emulsification. Today I'll we'll be talking to you regarding capsular contracture and capsular distension syndrome. The main purpose of uh, surgery, as we know, is achieving a perfect lens centration, preventing the IOL tilt and the distortions, and obviously the getting a pristine optical quality for the better outcome. The anterior capsular contracture and shrinkage usually occurs much earlier than the posterior capsular opacification, usually in the, within the first three to six months. The contracture involves the anterior cuboidal lens epithelial cells, which in turn leads to metaplasia and myobro myofibroblastic transformation, which causes the contracture of this capsule. So when to suspect a capsular contracture is, on direct visualization of the slit lamp, obviously one will be able to make out the capsular contracture. If there is a change in the IOL position in the post-operative period, you should suspect capsular contracture. And obviously, resultant shift in refraction. So that gives a clue that patient must be having a capsular contracture. One we, why we should look into this is, one, it obscures the vision, changes the IOL position, as well as the function. And uh, of course, if the contracture continues, it can lead to the zonal license, and the IOL capsular back complex can get dislocated sometimes. In the era of presbyopic correcting IOLs, it carries much more relevance because the progressive contracture leads to the decentration, which reduces the optical quality as well as the best corrected visual acuity. So one need to look at the which are all the high-risk patients and how to avoid these complications. One should closely look into look into this. So what are the predisposing factors for the Optical uh, capsular contracture, one obviously, as we know, pseudo exfoliation, uveitis, retinal degenerations like uh, re retinitis pigmentosa, eye myopia, myotonic dystrophy, trauma. Uh, suppose somebody who has undergone a previous trabeculectomy or vitrectomy obviously will have a compromised zonules, which also contributes for the capsular contraction, diabetes, and the, in the instability of the blood aqueous mm. barrier. Does the creating of a large capsular excess uh, prevents the capsular contracture? Obviously, it is a good uh, sign if you do a good capsular excess, but it doesn't prevent the minimal capsular contraction in spite of a good optimal large excess. But only advantage is it gives a uh, large un unobstructed visual area if you've got a good excess. So don't leave the patient with a small excess. Try to do an ideal excess. Removing of anterior lens epithelial cells, definitely yes. The very maneuvers, the very uh, the modified maneuvers, you can do it. You can polish the anterior capsular remnants of the anterior capsule or you can rotate the nucleus multiple times when you do an hydro dissection. But the, there are some papers which show that if you get rid of anterior epithelial cells, even though it reduces the capsular contractions, sometimes it may induce early PCO also. So it's on the contrary to that, we should compromise one of them. So IOL design, obviously the silicon plated IOLs tends to have a more capsular contracture compared to the acrylic, even the silicon optic. The proline haptics tends to have a much more uh, capsular contracture the study reveals that whether the three piece or a single piece acrylic has more contracture is, so is a variable results which has shown. The square heads obviously prevents the PCO rather than the anterior capsular opacification. So carefully consider these factors, when, especially when you're considering a presbyopic correcting IOLs. Capsular tension rings to an extent prevents the capsular contracture and prevents the decentration of the IOL. In fact, the studies have shown that in a high risk patient, just placing a CTR is not enough. Sometimes you have to do a suture the capsular tension rings as well as the segments to prevent the late onset capsular contracture and or subluxation of these IOLs. So try to suture these uh, uh, additional things like segments and the uh, CTRs in high risk patients. So here is a patient with a due to the anterior capsular ca contracture, you can see a markedly thickened uh, anterior capsule. There will be a posterior vault which causes the increase in AC chamber depth. Simple treatment like NDAG laser to the anterior capsule sometimes uh, can uh, uh, bring about the relaxation of the capsule. You have to use uh, from the capsular marginal heads, you can apply the NDAG lasers for 0 0.5 to 1 mm of the optic, uh, IOL optic from that, you should uh, give a relaxing incisions, which prevents the, relaxes the capsular contracture and brings about the relief from this uh, contracture. So there will be whatever the, the only thing is, uh, incisions over the IOL optics should be avoided, uh, haptic should be avoided so because sometimes it can cause an asymmetrical lens tilt. So here the video showing the how to give a relaxing incision on the anterior lens capsule. 
Okay, post Jagger, you can, you can see that this is a left side is a pre-op, uh, pre-laser treat uh, picture, and the, uh, the on the right side is a post-laser treatment. There is a reduction in the antechamber uh, depth because of the relaxing incision. The lens has moved back to its position. So whatever the residual refractive error you had, uh, it has been. The another thing is a surgical maneuver. You can do it. You can the bimanual things are better, especially if there is a severe contracture because the longer the uh, the disease process there will be a lot of additions if you do it unimanually you tend to try to peel it you may compromise the zonules or you may uh, you may cause further co complications so you need to cut use a scissors or a cutter make a relaxing incisions do a bimanual maneuver take a pupillary margin as a reference mark go around it and cut as much as possible to enlarge the capsular opening so so the you have to choose the technique which suits you the better Either you can use the cutter, or if there is a dense membrane, probably you require one requires a scissor. Once you do that, you'll get a good opening in the anterior capsule. Sometimes you can use a femto laser to relax this uh, anterior capsule. This is a capsular contracture. The femto laser is being applied to relax the the capsular phimosis. This is the incision which is being applied. So if you got, got an access to the femtolaser, definitely femtolaser anterior capsulotomy is also an option. So what are the preparations and actions one should do in capsular contraction syndrome is be aware of the iris conditions, select the appropriate IOLs, consider CTR and segments preferable to suture them, and uh, you can polish the anterior lens capsule also. Multimodal approach, sometimes you may get away with NDIAG laser, sometimes you have to do a surgical maneuver to come out of these complications. The second complication is a capsular distension syndrome. The basically, it is nothing but a turbid fluid which occurs between the IOL and the posterior capsule. There are three times, three classifications which have been done. The classification either could be intraoperative, capsular back distension syndrome, early onset or a late onset. Depending upon the material which accumulates, either it could be fibrotic type of uh, material which is there, inflammatory or non-cellular. Fibrotic usually occurs because of the lens epithelial cell proliferation. And uh, uh, the treatment for this is disruption of the capsular back. Inflammatory typically tends to occur in the early period because of the AC anterior cell cellular reaction which occurs and causes the fluid, turbid fluid between the lens and the posterior capsule. The anti-inflammatory drugs helps in these cases. Non-cellular, of course, if you leave behind a lot of viscoelastics behind the IOL, tend to cause this capsular distension syndrome. I told the causes for the each one of these things, early onset and late onset. The another classification is looking at the transparency of the PC and transparency of the anterior chamber, anterior capsule, as well as the Turbidity of the fluid, whether it's a transparent fluid or a turbid fluid, based on that also you can, the severity you can classify it as type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. So what are the differential diagnosis for a capsular back distension syndrome? Sometimes you may confuse this with the severe uveitis. Even the, sometimes if you don't do a proper examination in undilated pupil, you can think of an PCO also, chronic end of, then the pupillary block glaucoma, and sometimes nowadays with the recent uh, opaque hydrophilic IOL, so you may say that this is an opaque hydrophilic IOL rather than looking at the the proper examination for them. Anti-segment OCT definitely gives a clear cut uh, uh, the clue to the diagnosis. You can make out the clear separation, the fluid accumulation, and the level of the PC as well as the IOL. So one should do uh, AC, AS OCT or in UBM to get to this. So one thing is early asymptomatic patients you can observe. If there is a cellular deposits, you can do an anti-inflammatory drops. NDI capsulotomy definitely helps, but one thing with anti NDI capsulotomy in capsular distension syndrome is sometimes it can induce an inflammation. Whatever the fluid there in the bag can go into the vitreous cavity and can induce an inflammation. Sometimes a slit lamp needle link itself can enough to bring about the, the fluid and the other things. Anterior chamber aspiration and the capsulectomy also you can do it with the past planar route. But the disadvantage with past, uh, past planar vitrectomy and posterior capsulectomy is more invasive procedure. But the only thing is you can get rid of the fluid completely so that the vitreous inflammation and the contents going into the vitreous cavity will be reduced. This is a pre-op and the post-op, uh, post-treatment pictures. You can see the turbid fluid in the upper picture, which has been a post-treatment, post yag post laser. It is completely resolved. The another thing you can do is, if you don't want to do, an, if it is a transparent PC, you don't want to make an opening in the PC, you can do a small peripheral iridotomy which ruptures the anterior capsule. So whatever the fluid accumulated, which gets comes into the anterior chamber and then gets absorbed, or you can do an uh, AC wash just that so get rid of the these things. So NDI laser, it is nothing uh, routine from the regular ag capsulotomy. What we tend to do. So once you do that, you tend to get rid of the fluid, and the fluid goes into the disappears, and you will get a clear visual axis. 
sometimes just a separation of the capsular adhesion to the ant lens optic itself is enough to tap this fluid. So go inside, just separate the capsular rim, so you will get access to the, the turbid fluid in the posterior between the behind the lens. Just separate the that capsular radiation was there to the lens. Once you're done, just tap the IOL, all the fluid comes out. Whatever the retro IOL accumulated fluid is there, comes onto the anterior chamber, and you can just wash it so to get a clear visual access. This is my last slide, I'll be finishing it. Kate. You can see that the, all the turbid fluid has gone away, and that now it looks a, a perfect thing. Okay, thank you. These are the two common complications you tend to see and uh, you can manage it at case to case basis and get a good outcome of this. Thank you. Yeah, one clinical point I would like to ask you Sunil. I think most of us here are cataract surgeon. So once you implant the intraocular lens, you tend to see a, within the bag, you tend to see a stretch mark in the PC, the straight stretch mark. Sometimes this stretch mark really irritates the patient very much and they come with a lot of glare and hellos. So when you'd like to do YAG, do you want to do very next day YAG or do you uh, will wait? Not definitely in the IOL post-operative, the immediate post-operative period. So uh, preferably you, allow, you should allow the some fibrosis to occur, then better to do an YAG laser than the immediate post-operative period. And one more take-home message for uh, beginners, those who do cataract surgery. After you finish your FACO, after you polish the PC also with the uh, regular whatever the cleaning method whether by manual or whether it is coaxial or even simco the best method to prevent pco what i observed take a 20 gauge bend cannula with the 2 cc syringe slowly you flush within the bag just minimum flush so whatever the epithelial cells which is sticking onto the pc that will come out and the incidence of PCO is coming, drastically coming down. Yeah, one more thing I would like to add is whatever I showed are the capsular contracture and is all related to the adult cataracts. The pediatric capsular contracture, it's a different ball game itself. You will not be able to get away so easily. There will be severe contracture. Probably you may end up with IOL exchange sometimes because the fibrosis and radiation causes, if you try to pull it, do a surgical manual, you may induce retinal damage or zonal dialysis and all. So pediatric patients, you should be much more careful than the adult patients. Thank you. Sir, stretch line, definitely, it's a good sign also in the intraoperatively. It gives a clue that it, uh, you have implanted perfectly in the back first thing. The second thing is the stretch line is a transient thing. Sometimes you may not see in the first or the second post-operative day. Immediately, the fluid, uh, you would have aspirated the fluid and other things. You can see clear cut. But it disappears in some patients also. That is not the only criteria to treat the patient, the presence of stretch line. Sometimes PCO causes distortion. That is an indication for treatment rather than the, the IOL positioned stretch line. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. I think uh, just continuing with uh, how to tackle this uh, post cataract surgery refractive surprise, very important talk. So I'll be just uh, trying to how to solve this problem. So refractive surprise is the failure to achieve the intended post operative refractive target. It either can, ana can cause anisometropia or in some patient even it can cause a dominant switch one eye to the other eye. So the, what is the benchmark? I think 85% per, of the eyes should be have a refractive surprise within one diopters or 55% within 0.5 diopters of target spherical equivalent refraction following the surgery. So your biometry has to be dead accurate. So let me come to the prevention. The best way to manage refractive surprise is prevent it. Accurate biometry a cost optimization. I think uh, still some of our friends still being doing with the opti oh, the immersion technology. I think you may have to do two to three readings. Make sure that the proper IOL will be implanting. And very important is to select the proper intraocular lens formula. And last in the end, being a surgeon, whatever your assistant gives also, don't try to. Always in my OT. I keep my case sheet open 
and my assistant has to show me the exact lens, exact A constant and the particular lens power then only I will implant. So first, once you got already post uh, cataract surgery refractory surprise, now how to identify the cause? First, first uh, do the refraction, subjective refraction to the patient. Very important thorough detailed fundus examination is very, very important. And uh, detailed examination in the sense, see to that whether you have put a tight corneal suture, if the patient referred from the other places. Then look for a placement of the intraocular lens, whether in the sulcus or whether it is subluxated. Because see what happens, we when we do with the optical biometry, normally it tend to give in the bank implantation. But you would have put the lens in the sulcus, that itself will get you 0.5 adapters of uh, residual refractory error. So it's very important to implant the lens within the bag. Then sometimes this distended capsular bag is might be due to the retained viscoelastic behind the eye That is also very, very important. Then always look for a, any presence of corneal pathology, whether you would have missed that corneal scarring, whether already post-op patient is having a corneal edema, you need to find out. In the end, I need to, f especially patient with a uh, distended bag with the visco behind, normally it gives a myopic shift. So you have to have a very good slit lamp examination afterwards. Later on, if the patient is still having a hyperopic shift, always keep in mind that patient is having a post-operative cystoid macular edema. That time you may have to do the OCTs. So I think uh, cause, I think review the refractive history as well as the biometry, take out hold the case sheet, what IOL selection process, surgical records. All, once again, major cause if you ask me is wrong patient biometry and uh, whatever the, whatever the you, and wrong A constant. See, I had a, one my personal experience. Same lens, hydrophobic lens, I don't want to Tell about the company, same hydrophobic lens, same material, same design. But one lens has been manufactured around one year before, has got a different A constant, and other lens has been manufactured after one year, which has got a totally different A constant. When you put in the biometry, when you put it in the IOL Master 700, if you put for the both models, suddenly you will see a difference of 1.5 adapter. Suppose if your assistant make that mistake, then you are something you cannot excuse yourself. So always check the axial length by repeating the biometry. Check for abnormal keratometry. All my patient, whenever I do premium surgery, even for monofocal, I do topography. I just want to make clear that the patient doesn't have the undiagnosed keratoconus. If there has been no error, refractive surprise can be attributed to now next is effective lens position. And a similar error may occur in the fellow eye also. You have to be very, very careful. One of the patient uh, you always used to have a, their effective lens position used to change, used to come back to me every time with a one adapter. I used to make a arc, then later on I had a problem. So it is very, very important about the effective lens position. So coming to the management, explain the error openly to the patient. Apology. Apology means it is not you have done the mistake. This is not a declaration guilt what you are telling to the patient, but an acknowledgement that you have not achieved the desired target refraction. Even you can take a second opinion also that makes patients mo more uh, believing you. So options. Sometimes if it is very minimal post refractive, uh, this one uh, surprise happened, very minimal refractive error remaining, doing nothing is the best option. Because many refractive surgery do not require further surgery. Suppose patient, there is some amount of myopia remain. They will not grumble you just because of they will have a very good near vision. And some patient might be already wearing spectacles before cataract surgery. If you explain that you are already wearing glass, we are giving the glasses, I think you can continue with that. So correcting this surprise depending upon the comforts of the surgeon, which I will use, how long it has been, lens has been implanted. Of course, retain viscoelastic. Uh, this is the one indication I would like to insist here about the early laser capsulotomy. Around one month, still that visco remaining. Then early 
laser capsulotomy can disperse the viscoelastic and allow the anterior displaced IOL to move posteriorly. Then corneal refractive surgery, very important, not before one to three months for small amounts of residual error or to even can wait. The best option, PRK or LASIK, even those are with the smile also. In terms, I think the results with PRK and LASIK is same. In older patient, PRK is better because of, I think, uh, the dry related complaints. For younger patient, I think you can do LASIK or you can do even with the smile also. So one or two words about the ablation profile, what you have to go. Best is, I think, wave, wavefront guided treatment that gives a better results than the conventional LASIK. However, some authors are explained, especially Shaq Hartman abrometer in eyes with the multifocal IOL. According to the Generita et al. evaluated the outcome of wavefront guided treatment with the iris registration after implantation of different multifocal IOLs in 29 eyes of 19 patients. They found good results with the diffractive multifocal IOLs, but not with the refractive IOLs. So once again, I am insisting here, go ahead with the wavefront guided treatment with the PRK with a small amount of refractive error. LASIK seems to be safe eyes with the previous YAG capsulotomy. But once if you do a YAG capsulotomy, never ever think about IOL exchange. So always you have to keep YAG capsulotomy in the end. Once the, if you like, uh, once if you done the LASIK flab in established, additional optical adjustment can be also performed whenever it is necessary. So there are lot of limitations even for laser refractive procedure. Because see, most of us I think don't have a refractive machine, extra cost. And uh, some patients with a low corneal stromal thickness also you cannot do the LVC. So the other option for uh, is lens based procedure. Either you can go for IOL exchange or picky back IOL. Especially patient with a high degree of spherical error. So very important, do not alter the anterior corneal surface and also do not change the corneal refractive power. Very, very important. Whenever you are doing either IOL exchange or with the piggy peg IOL. So there is no special setting is required. Those who require for laser refractive surgery. So add on sulcus IOL. I think it has becoming much, much popular. Lot of patients are coming to us. I think these lenses, these are the piggy peg lenses giving a very good results. I think only thing is you need to know exactly if you ask the company, they will tell you how to inject. You can put it over the previous lenses. Uh, piggy bag lenses are less accurate than the laser refractive surgery, but definitely good for high degree of refractive errors. So piggy bag lenses, uh, of course, easiest surgery. The only disadvantage always you should have come across this complication, patients with a pigmented dispersion. Of course, so these piggy bag lenses are much expensive than the regular lenses also. You need to think about that. Of course, I have been using this Sulcoplex lens from one of the company from London, no financial interest. But a lot of patients, I think post uh, cataract surgery, they wanted to implant a multifocal lens. I tried with this Sulcoplex multifocal lens. It has given me a tremendous results. In conclusion, LVC laser refractive surgery has been shown a viable non-invasive and accurate procedure to correct hematropy after cataract extraction with IOL implantation. Lens-based procedure, IOL exchange or piggyback lens implantation are also possible alternative. Piggyback intraocular lens, technically easier, more accurate than IOL exchange. Better indicated cases with extreme hematropia, corneal abnormalities, or when there is no available of examer platform. Thank you, one and all, for like hearing. Correction with the lens, piggyback, rather than a sulcoflex, any role for uh, the implantable phakic uh, lenses in the sulcus? Yeah, good question, uh, Dr. Vikram. I think uh, uh, I have tried in a couple of patients actually with the residual refractive error with uh, phakic lenses. Uh, it, it gives a excellent results, uh, one of the imported company. But uh, once again, cost. Uh, because these lenses are very, very expensive. You have to tell the patient that uh, you have to pay more. Already you would have charged more for the patient. But it really works, especially I have got a high oh, amount of uh, oh, refractive error remaining. If it is minus 6, minus 8, I think uh, oh, 
this fakey cleanser is also one of the options. Yeah, I think uh, uh, w- even with the smaller uh, degrees of residual, now we do have uh, the fake X with the low myopia also. Only thing is the cost being the limit. Cost the and problem. also you need to look for uh, exactly the ACD. Of course, after the cataract after surgery, the normally yes. ACD will be deep. But mm-hmm. one of the patient I still remember four years before I implanted fake X lens over the uh, already implanted lens. I could be able to see after uh, two years of follow-up some amount of interface uh, uh, membrane sort of thing. In fact, uh, even after the YAG patient was not so happy. So my m- best option, sulcoplex, yeah. is then this fake lenses. Y- if you are planning LASIK after the uh, for the refractive surgery, so when you can plan for LASIK after the? That is after minimum you have to wait three months, mm. stabilize then you rethink don't uh, if the patient come to me after uh, 15 days you ask him to wait then uh, uh, wait for three months then take a call thank you ah retain visco is a go- good question i do it after 15 days actually uh, what they say one and a half months but i have done after 15 days some a very very unhappy patient with uh, minus one 1.5 then uh, because see sometimes what will happen patient with a distended bag it will not absorb also. Then we need to make a way it has to go back. That time you have to do. Very small opening, one small opening. I think that will not cause any cystoid macular edema. Yeah. PC wash, that is what, uh, that is what I was talking the previous talk. PC wash, PC wash, I do with that. Uh, bend 26 gauge needle. Slow wash after the cataract surgery. Just to make sure that all cells will be cleared before implanting the UL. After implanting the UL, some of our friends, of course, that is the best technique, go underneath the UL and wash. But some of us, like pr- when you are doing a premium surgery, your heart will be beating. While going behind the UL, suddenly if you <laughs> prick the PC, then you are gone. Whatever you are done, like then it will be heck of a scene. I think uh, just before putting the lens only, you have to do all the manipulation. Okay, so... N- uh, Sulcoplex, I think, uh, now Indian company, th- th- I think uh, around uh, 15 to 20,000 rupees, our cost. Fakey is around 20, 25,000 Indian make, imported make. If you want to put a toric, then it will go up to 50,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have any. I use only from Rainer, Sulcoplex. So... One should do only behind. But uh, see, the, the, uh, once again, it depends upon how much is your surgical manipulation in that particular case. If you think that you have ma- manipulated so much and after putting the lens, if you think that, okay, you may damage the PC, that time suddenly some of the surgery. Hmm. Higher red, but uh, the only. Hmm. <coughs> no, high, high, viscoel- high molecular weight viscoelastic, it has to be taken out only. But when you're taking out also, it comes in a mass, in a bolus. So you need not have to worry for that. HPMC is a big headache. Yeah, but one has to clean up only. Yeah, it has to clean up only. I normally use a low molecular weight. Initially, I inflate the bag with a low molecular weight. Then later on, I put a high molecular weight. Then I inject a lens. Yeah. So I was explaining, like, if it is retained visco, then what to do? Yeah, Thank now uh, let's start with uh, dysphotopsia. So this has been done by Dr. Vikram Jain. So he's our medical director of Prasad Netralia Mangalore. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shaman. Uh, going directly to the topic, dysphotopsia is when a patient has very good vision, but not only 6'6", he sees much more. He sees much more light, much more unwanted stuff, and you are happy he is not. Okay. Uh, these 
are expected with any multifocal implant. So this is not what we are bothered about. This you wouldn't put in a patient who is a type A personality who would naturally complain. You would also be hesitant. You would have warned the patient about this. There are many more other uh, positive and negative dysphotopsias that we would want to talk about. Basically, these are undesirable optical phenomenon. They are subjective to the patient. We can't really measure it. Positive dysphotopsias are seen in the form of streaks, starbursts, <laughs> and arcs. Negative dysphotopsia is what we commonly see on the temporal side, a shadow which the patient keeps complaining about. With multifocal lens, we already know about the halos and the rings which are caused by the multiple rings on the lens itself. So as I mentioned, uh, there are no objective tests. You should distinguish to see that these are not flashes of light caused by uh, vitroretinal traction or the striae we were earlier talking about, which is causing a Maddox rod effect. And this is not a dysphotopsia. That is just the Maddox rod effect caused by the striae on the posterior capsule. Negative dysphotopsia is the dark shadow, whereas positive dysphotopsia are the artifacts of li light which are described by the patients. Positive dysphotopsias, an arc is sometimes perceived by patient in slightly less illuminated condition. That is actual uh, edge of the IOL which is casting a uh, different light reflex. It resolves over time, especially when the capsule opacifies as long as the capsule is covering the edge. So it's very important to make sure that the capsule overlaps the uh, edge of the IOL. Flare is caused by small refractive errors like coma. They also resolve with time. Uh, by constricting the pupil at night time, this can be avoided in the initial days. Later on, it, this goes away. Central flash is something most patients also complain about. This is because of total internal reflection occurring at the edge of the IOL. Because of this, manufacturers have made certain changes. So here you're seeing the light which is incident getting reflect, uh, reflected off the edge of the IOL and get uh, the patient perceiving another light there. Starbursts are caused by back uh, backscatter of the lens body itself. Halos and glare again would be seen with the multifocal IOLs. So these positive dysphotopsias are more common with square edge IOLs, IOLs with an oval optic which are not available now as well as IOLs with a high refractive index. This is very common with IOLs with high refractive index. Changes made by the manufacturers, the square edge on the anterior surface was removed, they make it more rounded. If the square edge is more, there is more uh, total internal uh, reflection. By rounding this edge, the total internal reflection is uh, minimalized to a certain extent. Therefore, this complaint nowadays is not seen as frequently as it used to be. Also, present day IULs have this lenticular edge wherein the thickness in the periphery is reduced when compared to the non-lenticular designs. Management of positive dysphotopsias, they gradually go off in time, therefore they don't actually need any uh, active management. Correct any refractive error, small refractive error, because that will then uh, make the patient uh, to point out to some defect. If he, his vision is good, he might not notice this. If any ocular surface diseases are there, like Dr. Rohit has already mentioned, that has to be treated. If there's any capsular opacification, that has to be taken care of. Meiosis in the initial days will be helpful. Very rarely for high refractive index lenses, an IOL exchange might need to be done. If the patient is that very symptomatic, even after six months, he's still complaining about seeing these arcs and all, then uh, IOL exchange may be done. YAG capsulotomy will not solve this, therefore, there's no point doing a YAG capsulotomy unless there is a posterior capsular opacification. Coming to the negative dysphotopsia, as I mentioned, these are the dark shadows. Initial first month, a lot of patients will complain about it. This generally goes off between three to six months and at the end of one year, two to three percent of our patients generally still have this, although the intensity might decrease and they would complain about it only if you ask them about it. Better not to ask them about it unless they complain about it. Why is it a temporal dysphotopsia? That's be probably because the nasal retina extends further anteriorly. 
also the nose of the bridge cuts off light which is coming on the nasal aspect and therefore it's not seen on that side. One more thing is that this negative dysphotopsia is worsened by a constricted pupil whereas the positive dysphotopsias are treated with a constricted pupil. Negative dysphotopsia can occur with an incision in any location with any IOL as long as it is in the bag. It is not seen in uh, IOLs which are either fully in the sulcus or partially in the sulcus or with AC IOLs. It is not seen with poorly centered lenses. Basically, it's an anatomically perfect surgery that you've done. You are happy, patient is not happy. More frequently seen with higher uh, diopters uh, in hypermetropes and again in IOLs with higher refractive indices. This is how the patient would generally describe it. Either it's a translucent area or a totally opaque area on the temporal side. So this is of a left eye of a patient. There are uh, two schools of thought as to what causes this. Holiday calls it the edge penumbra, like when you're seeing an eclipse, you have two sources of light and then in between them a dark uh, crescent. Uh, Samuel Maskett says it's because of an IOL which is slightly more posterior. So this is the edge penumbra because of again uh, uneven refraction at the edge. Some rays would go in this direction, most rays would go there. In between you have the edge penumbra. Again it is lesser with the rounding edge but we do see that this persists. That's why uh, Maskett then described uh, the other one. Now this is a positive dysphotopsia, total internal reflection occurring there. You get another source of light on that aspect. Now here, because of the gap between the IOL and the iris, there is enough space for light to go in directly without undergoing any refraction at the IOL. Better this. So you have some light which is going through the edge of the pupil in front of the IOL reaching the retina. The other light is getting refracted <laughs> and reaching there. Therefore, in between you have the dark shadow which is being formed. This is not due to total internal reflection. That is the positive dysphotopsia. The negative dysphotopsia is because in this area there is no light reaching because the light in front does not have an IOL for refraction. Here you have some refraction. Uh, that is why in higher plus powered lenses because this gap would be higher, it is more common. Surgical management for this is to disrupt this aberrant light pathway either by putting a sulcus piggyback IOL or reverse optic capture wherein the optic of the lens is got in front into uh, in front of the uh, anterior capsule or repositioning the whole IOL into the sulcus. Uh, dysphotopsia IOL has also been uh, described wherein the edge of the capsule then sits in a small ledge in the anterior surface of the IOL. If this is occupied, according to Maskett, the dysphotopsia comes down. But the best way is masterly inactivity. Do nothing. There is central adaptation. We don't see our own physiological blind, uh, blind spot. The natural lens also has some backscatter. That is not perceived by us. Retinal blood vessels are not perceived by us. This is all because of central adaptation. So this would be the best management. Give the patient some time it goes off. If it doesn't goes off, then you might have to think of some surgical aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. I think a very interesting talk. I think positive, dis you need to really know about what exactly is the positive dysphotopsia and negative dysphotopsia. As you said that, for negative dysphotopsia, I think uh, people, if you m make it uh, constricted, that is always better. For positive, for positive it is better. Hmm. For negative, it will worsen it. Worsen. Worsen it. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, let's go to the next talk. I think uh, I invite Dr. Shaman Shetty, dynamic surgeon from uh, Prasad Netralaya Hospital, Udupi. He'll be talking about decentered intraocular lens and IOL tilt.
a very big, uh, good afternoon to everyone and i uh, thank you uh, dr kp for this opportunity and uh, aios for this uh, opportunity too so i'll start with my topic and that's a uh, decentralization in iolted so i'll start with giving you a brief introduction about uh, what's uh, about uh, decentralization in tel so let's uh, go about it so basically we see around this is not usually only be, uh, due to your uh, complicated surgery but even after a normal uh, cataract surgery also we can see some of this what can happen usually the percentage from 0.2 to 1.8% of uh, surgeries uh, patient we can see this basically there is no clearly uh, a definition for decentration or an iol tilt but in terms like what you can say is if we are seeing that pupillary axis and the iol axis the distance between that is what is called as your decentration and the degree between that is called as your iol tilt so what is the cause for your tilt so one again like when you have a capsular fibrosis or your haptics uh, you are not positioned it properly your scleral uh, uh, scleral iols if you not sutured uh, correctly your uh, previous ppv uh, surgery patients so in all of this uh, in uh, like uh, uh, patients whatever is there like basically when your iol is not in position some of the any of these factors can cause your iol to move from its place that is what is going to cause you a tilt so seeing for your dis uh, decentration mainly during your surgery if you are having a large rexus where your iol is going to keep popping out from your rexus so you are having a zone of weakness in one of your quadrant again you are going to see your iol being not in your position and it's going to keep tilting placement again when you are uh, trying to load your iol your uh, one haptic is cut and you are try still trying to go ahead with it so that is where all these things happened with one haptic again in the bag or the sulcus so this is during your surgery where a decentration is going to happen 100% next where are you going to see again like maybe days or weeks one again like when your toric iol gets decentered up or like during a patient with a zonal weakness months or later years especially in trauma patients or pseudo exfoliation or marfans so what basically happens in decentration why is it like is it so important if at all you have a decentration and that is more than your 1 mm this is going to cause you your vision problem it is all your aberrations are going to come into place your glare your halos your starburst patient is basically not going to be happy vision is going to be decreased astigmatism going to come and defocusing is going to be there so once this starts patient is not going to be happy at all and he will start eating your head what has gone wrong and this is absolutely even though he's got a premium surgery or a normal surgery he is basically not happy so what is the effects of decentration on your pupil as long as the pupil is small they might not feel it but once the pupil starts dilating all your aberrations are going to start that is where they're going to start feeling it more so how do we evaluate for the decentration so let's uh, start with like what is the degree of uh, decentration its complication what it can get into and what are the main symptoms what the patient comes up mild is when the its the optic is still there and there's a very mild decentration when it's like uh, more than your half of your pupillary space is still covered by your optic if it is like moderate it's already like crossing your uh, less than half of your pupillary space subluxated it's already hanging down luxated it's already down there so i've uh, what are the complications again when you're having a decentration one an inflammation your iop increases retinal damage cme or vitreous incarcerations already these are some of the major uh, complication which you are going to see in the patients with decentration symptoms as i said glare floaters monocular dysphosopsia decreased visual acuity and uh, it all again depends upon you know your degree of malposition of your eye oil there so how are we going to measure this like you know the exact uh, degree of your uh, decentration or tilt usually like starting we used to use this perkinje meter when you used to get that image the third perkinje image which you used to get it used to be has to be full in uh, patients of this decentration you are only going to get a half of your third image so that is what in the perkinje meter which you are going to get and second the patient needs to take for a long time to go sit uh, and uh, take the image and you are not going to get the exact value coming next like we uh, upgraded to uvm uvm you can get the uh, amount of degree of decentration but you are again using a coupling or a, you know uh, the deform the eyeball can be deformed so that is again going to alter your value so you exactly cannot know the exact degree of decentration or iol tilt by uvm you can make out uh, uh, definitely you can come to know whether there is a tilt or a decentration there next coming to your seam flub uh, imaging this is going to be very fast you can make out all your eye ocular structures in that the uh, only major drawback here is you need a pupil 
di dilatation of more than 6 millimeter. So if at all your pupil doesn't dilate more than that, you're not going to get to this. Next comes to the AC ASOCT. Before, you, uh, they used to, you know, construct a 3D model. In that, like, you know, they used to get to know what is the exact degree. But now, like, in the newer module, like your Cassia and uh, IOL Master 7 and Rindol, they can, uh, you know, exactly get from the software the degree of uh, decentration and the tilt which is uh, available there. Next, coming to eye trace, that's again a ray tracing aberrometer which is going to give you a topography and your wavefront aberrations which are there in this. So this has some, like you are, when you are going to see the topography map in your eye trace, your higher order aberrations are seen. So that exactly you can make out which is more, your comma, your trefoil, what is more, what is causing your, uh, uh, you know, aberrations to occur. Even uh, the in, tri in uh, eye trace, there is something called as like the dysfunctional lens index. You see the value. If the more the value is, it is good. If it comes the lesser, then you are seeing the image being distorted, so you know what is exactly causing it. So this is again like a small example where a patient was implanted with an uh, iris claw. In the first diagram, like, you know, we can see like what are all the aberrations which is causing here. Uh, your astigmatism which is causing here and this is what is your residual refractive uh, power which is left. But the same patient when you take it up and you know you reclaw it again and you make the uh, lens stable, the whole thing you know is changed. Your astigmatism is changed, your refraction is changed, the amount of aberrations what has uh, occurred is changed. So basically your uh, you know the patients uh, start becoming happy. So how are we going to manage it? So the major, um, if it is like very small amount of decentration, patient is asymptomatic, you can just leave it and keep observing it. But the time patient is, uh, you know, symptomatic, it you can take it up any time. You don't need to wait it out. If at all you're already like, you know, it's on the table, you're seeing the half of your haptic is cut, all those things. So it's uh, no point like you leave it for a long time and then again it is going to be a mess to take it up. Depending upon the situation of how bad or what the complication is, that is the time like you know you go to intervene. So what are the main again like how are you going to intervene? One either you try to reposition it, you try to remove it and exchange it or then again like you know last you go off with your secondary eyewalls. Before you do anything of it, like when you see the decentration is already there, try to do like a proper anterior vitrectomy, take a VR uh, opinion if at all you need and uh, you try to do manage the subluxation. Outcomes and complication, finally you see like it all depends on your preoperative macular function, complication of your final operation and your CME or RD which is occurring. Surgical approach is mainly limbal or pars plana for depending upon your decentration. So repositioning, correct the alignment of your toric, correct uh, the black placement, sulcus placement if it's already your bag is gone. If at all you need to still go ahead with the black placement, put a capsular uh, supporting device if it's possible. If you're exchanging it, use your sodium hyaluronate, use your IOL cutting uh, forceps. If you're going ahead with the SF IOL, make sure it's a four quadrant and you tighten the suture or if it's a two, this thing, you make it like a uh, 180 degree apart uh, scleral uh, sclerotomy. So summary wise, management strategy is important. Decentration more than your one millimeter and your five degree apart is very important. Use your capsular uh, support device wherever it is uh, necessary. Hydrophobic IOLs are better because it's not going to cause you much of your capsular fibrosis. So negative impact of the patient has to be addressed. Visual performance, especially in your multifocal or torix, make sure your toricity is aligned. And that will again, you know, will not give you uh, your IOL uh, tilt and decentration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaman, for an excellent talk. I think uh, uh, we'll just take the question in. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. So I think uh, cataract surgery, from the anterior segment perspective, you have done all good job. You're all happy that you've done a, uh, every uh, system. I think patient don't take glare and hello. Still patient is unhappy. Do they have any other problem apart from uh, anterior segment problem? Is it associated with retinal pathology immediately postoperatively? How to treat this? We have got a young dynamic surgeon from Prasad Netrala, Dr. Sharat Hegde. He'll be touching upon the importance uh, of ret how to treat the associated retinal pathology. Thank, thanks, Dr. Krishna Prasad. So our em eminent speakers have told about what are the anterior segment complications can be there which can make the patient unhappy. So I'm just to be touching what can be the retinal pathologies are there. Any pa retinal pathology can make the patient unhappy, but what are the retinal pathologies which can cause it? So 
the most important like it can be subnormal vision after a cataract surgery which can be a non improvement in the vision that means after the cataract surgery patient doesn't have any improvement in the vision or initially he had a better improvement then after some days there was a again decrease in the vision or it can be because of recurrent floaters like multiple floaters like thing or flashes also might make the patient unhappy so there are like various conditions which can cause the retinal conditions let me come to the common conditions so the patient underwent a very nice cataract surgery 66 for the vision then after 3 to 4 weeks he came and says i am not able to see clearly my reading vision has becoming an issue and when we see clinically everything looks all right IL is in position and all when we see the fundus we can see there is something called a yellow dot sign sometimes or slightly the fr reflex is dull and when we do the OCT, OCT, we can able to see the presence of large cystic spaces and the neurosensory detachment. So this is commonly we see called cystoid macular edema. And most commonly we see it around four to six weeks after the cataract surgery. And if, if the patient has any intraoperative complications like PC rent or any other features, the chances of having this cystoid macular edema is common. And if the patient has previous history of uveitis or diabetes, the incidence of cystoid macular edema increases. So for these conditions, usually we prefer they resolve by itself. Uh, it will take at least three to four months to decrease. So what we do nowadays, we give the sh uh, we can give NSAIDs, nepafenac or uh, bromfenac eye drops, or we prefer to give steroids. Usually we prefer to give periocular steroids in that like uh, posterior subtenous or transeptal kinocot injections. Or if it is not resolving till then, then we can go for the ozodex injection also, or we can go for the anti of injection also in certain conditions. So this is the one of the patient where after giving the kinocot injection, after by one month, the cystoid macular is nicely decreased and the patient is happy. The other most important condition what we see nowadays is diabetes with cataract. So most of the patient will be having some type of diabetes and all. So two things can happen. The patient can have a diabetic macular edema before a cataract surgery and the patient may have a large, large cataract, uh, very ma mature cataract and where we are not able to see. So it is associated with increased risk of worsening of the previous edema and one study has shown that at least 22% of the patient can develop macular edema. So this is the one patient who had a mature cataract and after doing a cataract surgery, we are seeing a large succinate retinopathy and having a large cystoid macular edema picture. So UK diabetic retropathy study has shown like after the cataract surgery, if the patient has severe NPDR and all, there is a high chance of developing diabetic macular edema in three to six months. Even if the patient has moderate or mild also, there is a high chance, but most commonly by three to six months, the diabetic macular edema will become clinically significant. The another study also says the same thing. There is a statistically significant increase in the macular edema after the cataract surgery. So that becomes important to analyze whether the cataract uh, diabetic macular edema or any diabetic uh, changes are there or not in a patient. This is the one patient where patient has slightly extrafoveal macular edema before the cataract surgery and if it, when it comes after three, three weeks we can able to see the macular edema has increased. So this patient required anti of injections and after two or three injections the vision become better. And another thing what we can miss sometimes when the cataract is more is the PDR retraction. So it may be very difficult to see certain times and when we may miss this traction and neovascularization in the eyes with a cataract surgery. So it becomes important to see the peripheral retina also. Some patients may have the vein occlusion where there will be thinning of the retina and it may be missed because the retina becomes very, uh, all the features of hemorrhage and all would have been decreased and you may not able to identify this condition. So in this preoperative OCT becomes most important. It's ideal to do all the, all the patients undergo preoperative OCT so that if any leftover or missed pathology can be found out. So this, uh, this is another case where you can able to see there is a presence of tributary vein occlusion or it's a old occlusion where clinically you may not able to identify it. But once after the doing the cataract surgery when the patient was not happy with his vision and when we did a FA and all we can able to see there's a presence of aneurysms, collaterals and there was a thinning. Next coming to the ERMs. So ERM can be there pre-operatively or post-operatively. And many studies have shown the ERM per se may not increase because of the cataract surgery. But if the patient has ERM, there is high chance of having inflammation and macular edema post having uh, ERM. So it's better to do, to look for the OCT and see how is the ERM is there before taking up the for the cataract surgery. Here is one of the case where you can able to see there was a ERM with mild thickening and af uh, after the cataract surgery, there was an increase in the macular edema, this condition. 
So this study also says the same thing where they have seen there is an increase in the macular edema than the uh, ERM, ERM which is not progressing. Other important condition which may miss because clinically it may be difficult to identify where there will be like a slight enhanced red reflex which will be there and that condition is vitromacular traction. So clinically it may become difficult. So there becomes the importance of examining the near vision also. Usually in the case of any macular pathologies, the near vision is affected more compared to the distance vision. So even sometimes the patient may have macular hole also. The other thing which can happen is when the patient has VMT and after doing a cataract surgery, the certain times the VMT can progress and this VMT progression can lead into the macular hole. So the surgery went all right, uh, everything, but the patient says his vision is blurred. So it's most important to become for us to see preoperatively how is the VMT, how is the vitreous adhesion and all. Another most important condition in the old age is AMD. It can be wet AMD or dry AMD. So OCT becomes important preoperatively pre to see whether any AMD features are there or not. So this is the condition of a dry AMD geographic atrophy and the vision loss may be because of that. So you have to look for the patient how he is seeing also. In the patient of wet AMD and dry AMD, most their central vision is lost, but their peripheral vision will be good. So th they are not able to identify who is, who is the person who is coming. They were able to identify some person is coming. So look, when the patient is coming inside the OPD, look for his gait and look his vision, how he is coming. That may give you an idea whether he has anterior segment pathology or a posterior segment pathology. So many studies have shown that whether the MAC ARMD increases after the cataract surgery. Per se, as the age increases, the ARMD can increase, but many studies have shown that cataract surgery per se is not going to have an effect on the ARMD changes. So other very rare condition, but very easily missed condition is parafoveal telangiectasias, where there will be some amount of early stage, there will be peri peripheral graying and all, which can be missed very easily because it's a very, not very rare, but very, Underdiagnosed condition nowadays because it's not clinically not significantly seen, but yes, OCT will help you to look onto this. <coughs> the other most commonly we see is the chronic CSR, where the patient in the early stage, young age, the patient would have been having a CSR and all, which has been resolved, but th there is now a chronic CSR DRP like picture. And this patient, when they develop cataract, it may be missed because he may not give this history, he may not give this history of having this previous condition. So make sure and do an OCT once and to see whether there is any picture of foveal thinning is there or not. This is another picture showing you having the chronic CSR. Other in the, if the patient is myopic and all, in the high myopia patient, sometimes there can be a myopic schisis or macular schisis. Make sure you look into that by doing an OCT. And very easily missed our condition is solar retinopathy because clinically it looks almost uh, right. It doesn't make difference, but OCT will show you the small lesion of ISOS junction disruption, which can be seen here clinically. And other condition also most important becomes is taking the history of the patients. So some patient may be having the joint pains and all in the young uh, old age, and they may be on the HCQ tablets and all, or they may have some on other uh, long-standing medications and all, like uh, uh, it, like for example HCQ. So they may be taking since many years and they may not reveal the history unless you ask them. So it becomes important for them to ask are they taking any other medications and all because HCQ can cause long-standing foveal changes and the OCT you can able to see here something called a flying saucer sign where there is a thinning of the ISOS junction and all. Other common conditions which is usually can be seen if the young patient comes with a cataract around 35 to 40 years of age, which can be a complicated cataract, make sure to rule out any dystrophies are there or not in their eyes. Like in this RP patient has a typical cystoid macular edema and the patient have central PSC also. Sometimes it may be missed because the patient may not give any history. The other most common condition which can be missed is the optic nerve pathologies, especially the ischemic maculopathy, uh, ischemic optic neuropathies where the NIN and all, they'll be having initially, there'll be a disc edema, but in the later stage, they'll be having only a temporal pallor of the disc. And this is sometimes easily misdiagnosed or undiagnosed because we are not looking onto that. So make sure you look into that. If it is, we have any doubt, get a visual fields done. So next coming into the floaters. So many patients will come, the surgery, everything is good, but I'm seeing something is moving in front of my eyes. Uh, Web-like thing is moving or a mosquito is moving inside our eyes. So there can be many conditions, and we have seen after the cataract surgery, the PVD induction is more common. 
So this PVD can become complicated or maybe a normal PVD also can cause the floaters. So reassure them, have the peripheral retinal examination because up to the complete PVD occurs, there is a high chance of retinal breaks and all. Do the regular examination till one month to see any retinal tears happens or not and reassure. If it is not decreased, then we have AG vitreolysis or the patient is very much uh, complaining, then we can go for vitrectomy also. Recurrent uveitis. If the lens is in sulcus or the patient has pseudo exfoliation or any pigment dispersion syndrome, this this can be a most common condition where the patient comes with recurrent redness. Even the vision is good, but he is not happy. So we have seen many patients having this recurrent redness if the patient has any complicated surgery or this thing. And also when there is a recurrent redness, you should also keep in mind of post-op endophthalmitis. The patient may, once you stop the steroids, the patient may have recurrent redness, pain, slight decrease in vision and all. So just keep in mind of post-op endo. Here you can able to see some whitish pigmentation and all which is there which can be confused with, can be a PCO. But you should look for the how is the pigments and all, because if you do a YAG cap, the end of field further complicated. This is another case which is show the fungal end of growth which is there. The patient vision is 20, 20, uh, 6 by 12 like that, but he, he having this end of, and when you are, the patient was on long stand steroids. So, but even then afterwards we did a, we went inside, we did the, uh, we cleared it up and we did the cryo also on that area so that because we, uh, most of the time they say we have to explant the IOL in a fungal this thing. But we tried doing the cryo and we didn't remove the IOL, luckily the patient recovered. Sometimes, yes, there is a, some, if there is a PC rent and all, some amount of cortex may go, some amount of the nucleus may go. And most of the times they resolve by one or two months if giving a long standing steroids. But sometimes if the small nucleus goes and sits in a pars plana, it may not resolve and may cause recurrent redness and recurrent inflammation. So proper history and previous treatment or what, whatever his patient is taking is becomes very important. Complete evaluation including the RAPD becomes important in the conditions. Preoperative OCT for all the patients help to detect any retinal problems to the certain extent. And if the mature, mature cataract is there, better to do ultrasound B scan to rule out any retinal detachments or any other features which can be seen. And control of the diabetes and control of diabetic macular edema becomes very much important before doing a cataract surgery. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharath, for a wonderful talk. I think uh, oh, a couple of questions from my side. Patient with a, a very severe NPDR, uh, you like uh, ret when we refer to the retina surgeon, they said that let us observe, let us not treat, then let the patient come back for uh, uh, follow up after three months. But such patient will be taking them for cataract surgery. Do you advise along with the cataract surgery lens implantation with uh, injection of uh, any of the uh, implants like Azuridex? So we'll see how, mu how much is the uh, severity of the NPDR. If it is more than moderate and severe, and if the patient has any extra foveal edema like picture, and the patient has significant cataract, I usually advise giving the Ozodex injection along with 15 days before the cataract surgery. Or if uh, there is very less uh, macular edema and all, I advise to give anti of injection also along with the cataract surgery. So this decreases the what we have seen clinically is that this giving the anti of injection along with the cataract surgery or a week before cataract surgery has drastically decreased the incidence of cystoid macular edema post cataract surgery in diabetic patients. And uh, patient with the cystoid macular edema like uh, around uh, uh, one month, two months of uh, post cataract surgery CME not happy patient. So when you what kind of do you go with the subtenance injection or do you advise to give a uh, intravitreal injection so of steroids? Initially we try with subtenance injection initially, how, how much he recovers. Most of the patients, 90% of the patients, they recover. If it is long-standing CME, yes, we go ahead with the Ozodex injection, which has a very nice recovery. But we go step by step. So in the end, overall take-home message for this particular uh, uh, instruction course, that is troubleshooting an IP cataract patient. The take-home message what I give, proper preoperative investigation. That means to start with the dry eye workup. As Dr. Roy Shetty said in the initial part, do the dry eye workup, treat the dry eye properly, then take him for cataract surgery. What and all the requirement, what and all the equipment you are having, depending upon that you have to do the dry eye treatment. So definitely, if you are going for a premium surgery, you need to have mebography in your clinical practice, then treat the dry eye. Then 
pre op other investigation like abrometry is very very important because just to rule out the just to get rid of the whether the patient is having already uh, keratoconus or any other abnormal uh, related and the kind of iol you can really pick them whether you go for premium iol surgery or monofocal of course if you do have got a topography try to use for all the cataract patient and in the end the very important investigation i would like to emphasize here is about the oct do oct for all your cataract patient make sure that they will not have any complication because most of them they think that after doing the indirect ophthalmoscopy oh retina is normal chalo cataract karenge then within one week patient will come back with the either with the diabetic macular edema or any complication so better to do a use most of the ornamenting with you make sure that in the end patient come up with a very very happy patient thank you one and all for one wonderful opportunity thank you